banks, the house of cards who are running the world economy, the backbone of the financial system. We all know how powerful banks are. But shadow banks? What are shadow banks? What is their job and how big they are? Shadow banking is an industry that is bigger than the world economy. By some estimations, it goes up to 100 trillion US dollars. Not a billion, trillion with a T. Shadow banks are big, powerful, and risky. They can drive the world's economy into crises and they are everywhere. So, let's explain what is hiding behind the term shadow banks. Who are the world's biggest shadow banks and how powerful and risky they are? To understand shadow banks, you must first clarify how they are different from regular banks. When people say bank, they often mean the commercial bank. Commercial banks hold money from population and companies and they lend it for interest. Commercial banks take deposits and they are heavily regulated by central banks or governments depending on the country's law. On the other hand, Shadow banks are entities that are doing bank-like activities but don't take deposits. So, they are not under the heavy regulations of governments. Under shadow banking are asset management firms, investment banks, hedge funds, issuers, money market funds, even some commercial banks, but more on that later. Under shadow banking are also pawn shops, loan shark operations, peer-to-peer -peer lending between individuals and businesses. And they don't even stop there. Some art dealers can be considered to be shadow banks. Sotheby's, for example, who loan money with interest to clients for buying masterpieces and making a lot of money from it. So, to be clear, even if shadow banking sounds sketchy to you, there is nothing illegal about shadow banking. It's the ultimate loophole of the financial system. Some people find the phrase shadow banking offensive and they prefer to call themselves market-based finance. The phrase shadow banking was first introduced by Paul McCulley at the annual meeting of the FED in 2007. So what do shadow banks do, and why are they so different from commercial banks? Commercial banks, when they lend you money, they look at how creditworthy you are. Because they have heavy regulations by central banks, central banks guarantee for commercial banks. On the other hand, shadow banks don't collect deposits and they are not under regulation by central banks, and because of that, they can go into much riskier credits. They are not backed up by the government in case of disaster, so there is a risk of a domino effect. But if they are so much riskier, how do shadow banks manage to attract money for lending? In the US, it all started with the securitization of the loans. Securitization is a fancy term when lenders or banks sell the loans to shadow banks or anyone else. So shadow banks take many different loans and group them together to create one loan. These group loans were called CDOs or Collateralized Debt Obligations. The CDOs contained loans like mortgages, car loans, student loans, etc. Then shadow banks sell pieces of CDOs to investors. And when people start to repay these loans, they are paid directly to investors, not the banks or shadow banks. This was the key to triggering the 2008 financial crisis. In 2008, the biggest problem 
was the credit rating and insurance of these loans. So if you collect deposits and issue credits, you are a bank and you are under heavy regulation. But if you're selling CDOs, you don't even need to be a bank. You can be just a regular company without regulations, so it's even worse. Meet BlackRock, the biggest and probably most powerful company in the world. It has $9.49 trillion in assets under management, and all this is done in just 33 years. To put that into perspective, $9.49 trillion is about 40% of the United States GDP. Before the pandemic in September 2019, BlackRock had $6.92 trillion in assets under management. They managed to increase their assets by $2.57 trillion in just two years when the whole world was upside down. This is a 37% gain of capital in two years. They made $2.4 billion just with GameStop. When you start to read the BlackRock investment portfolio, you can't tell the difference between Fortune 500 list, and they don't end up just in US-based companies. No, no. Europe is also heavily dominated by BlackRock. BlackRock is a company that holds 6% of Siemens shares. Almost the same amount is held by the Siemens family. Actually, there's not any company on the German stock exchange where BlackRock doesn't have shares. And when the 2008 crisis happened, who got called to clean the toxic assets? BlackRock, of course. And did BlackRock have shares in these companies with a toxic asset? Absolutely. But apparently, that was not the problem. Vanguard, a company that holds 7 trillion assets under management. It's the second largest right after BlackRock, and it is a company that makes index funds popular. It was founded in 1974 by John C. Bogle, who passed away in 2019 at the age of 89. The index funds were introduced in 1975. Before 1975, Wall Street didn't like the idea of index funds. Index funds were taking slow at the beginning, but after inflation in the 1980s, the priority was changed. Investors started to choose sustainable growth rather than more profitable and more risky investments. And this was something that Vanguard needs. So with this, just average growth, Vanguard manages to put $7 trillion in assets under management in just 46 years. So, the average investment is not so bad after all. Of all this, State Street is the oldest. In fact, it was founded in 1792. State Street is a bank holding company and it actually controls other banks. It has $3.59 trillion in assets under management and $43.3 trillion in assets under custody. Also, State Street knows the power of index funds. These companies have such a big influence on corporations around the world, so there will be future videos for all these companies. Separately, of course, we have many more interesting things to talk about. So the first country that adopted shadow banking on a mass scale was the United States. But it wasn't the only one. After 2008, China started to make more and more shadow banking activities. So the government, to stimulate the economy, started to make the climate for more and more loans. In other countries, shadow banking activities were mainly done by companies, hedge funds, investment banks, but not in China. In China, primarily, 
shadow banking activities were done by commercial banks. So, some started to refer to the shadows of the banks, not the shadow banking. And in China, it's called a wealth management product, another name for debt securitization. But this year, things started to change in China. On June 11th, China's government set up new, strict rules for shadow banking. So, they definitely want to slow down shadow banking. But why does the government allow this to happen? Why the government allows entities to do shadow banking activities? Because they help the economy to grow fast. When banks are more flexible with credit rates, investments are growing. More investment means more jobs. More jobs, higher incomes. Higher incomes means more spending. Bull market. Because when you have tight interest rates, investors are discouraged. So what do you think about shadow banks? Are they good or are they bad for the economy? Do you think interest rates should be tight or loose? Write down in the comments section. And don't forget to click the like button. And if you find this video interesting, for more videos, click the subscribe button as well as the bell icon. And always do it for the freedom.